Part 1. The Book of the Mind. Chapters 1 and 2 of The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1. The Nature of Life. Attempts to show what we know about life to set the bounds of real truth as distinguished from phrases and self-deception. If I could, I would begin this book by telling you what life is. But, unfortunately, I do not know what life is. The only consolation I can find is in the fact that nobody else knows either. We ask the churches, and they tell us that male and female created he them and put them in the garden of eden and they would have been happy had not satan tempted them but then you ask who made satan and the explanation grows vague you ask if god made satan and knew what satan was going to do is it not the same as if god did it himself so this explanation of the origin of evil gets you no further than the Hindu picture of the world resting on the back of a tortoise, and the tortoise on the head of a snake, and nothing said as to what the snake rests on. Let us go to the scientist. I know a certain physiologist, perhaps the greatest in the world, and his eager face rises before me, and I hear his quick, impetuous voice declaring that he knows what life is. He has told it in several big volumes, and all I have to do is to read them. Life is a tropism, caused by the presence of certain combinations of chemicals. My friend knows this because he has produced the thing in his test tubes. He is an exponent of a way of thought called monism, which finds the ultimate source of being in forms of energy manifesting themselves as matter. He shows how all living things arise from that and sink back into it. But question this scientist more closely. What is this matter that you are so sure of? How do you know it? Obviously through sensations. You never know matter itself. You only know its effects upon you, and you assume that the matter must be there to cause the sensation. In other words, Matter, which seems so real, turns out to be merely a permanent possibility of sensation. And suppose there were to be sensations caused, for example, by a sportive demon who liked to make fun of eminent physiologists. Then there might be the appearance of matter and nothing else. In other words, there might be mind and various states of mind. So we discover that the materialist, in the philosophic sense, is making just as large an act of faith, is pronouncing just as bold a dogma as any priest of any religion. This is an old-time topic of disputation. Before Mother Eddy, there was Bishop Berkeley, and before Berkeley, there was Plato. And they and the materialists disputed until their hearers cried in despair, What is mind? No matter. What is matter? Never mind. But a century or two ago, in a town of Prussia, there lived a little dried-up professor of philosophy, who sat himself down in his room and fixed his eyes on a church steeple outside the window, and for years on end devoted himself to examining the tools of thought with which the human mind is provided and deciding just what work and how much of it they are fitted to do. So came the proof that our minds are incapable of reaching to or dealing with any ultimate reality whatever, but can comprehend only phenomena, that is to say, appearances, and their relations one to another. The Königsberg professor proved this once for all time, setting forth four propositions about ultimate reality, and proving them by exact and irrefutable logic, and then proving by equally exact and irrefutable logic their precise opposites and contraries. Anybody who has read and comprehended the four antinomies of Immanuel Kant 
knows that metaphysics is as dead a subject as astrology, and that all the complicated theories which the philosophers from Heraclitus to Arthur Balfour have spun like spiders out of their inner consciousness have no more relation to reality than the intricacies of the game of chess. The writer is sorry to make this statement because he spent a lot of time reading these philosophers and acquainting himself with their subtle theories. He learned a whole language of long words and even the special meanings which each philosopher or school of philosophers give to them. When he had got through, he had learned, so far as metaphysics is concerned, absolutely nothing, and had merely the job of clearing out of his mind great masses of verbal cobwebs. It was not even good intellectual training. The metaphysical method of thought is a trap. The person who thinks in absolutes and ultimates is led to believe that he has come to conclusions about reality, when, as a matter of fact, he has merely proved what he already wants to believe. If he had wanted to believe the opposite, he could have proven that exactly as well, as his opponents will at once demonstrate. If you multiply two feet by two feet, the result represents a plane surface, or a figure of two dimensions. If you multiply two feet by two feet by two feet, you have a solid, or a figure of three dimensions, such as the world in which we live and move. But now, suppose you multiply two feet by two feet by two feet by two feet. What does that represent? For ages, the minds of mathematicians and philosophers have been tempted by this fascinating problem of the fourth dimension. They have worked out by analogy what such a world would be like. If you went into this fourth dimension, you could turn yourself inside out and come back to our present world in that condition and no one of your three-dimension friends would be able to imagine how you had managed it, or to put you back again the way you belonged. And in this, it seems to me, we have the perfect analogy of metaphysical thinking. It is the fourth dimension of the mind, and plays as much havoc with sound thinking as a physical fourth dimension would play with, say, the prison system. A man who takes up an absolute, God, immortality, the origin of being, a first cause, free will, absolute right or wrong, infinite time or space, final truth, original substance, the thing in itself, that man disappears into a fourth dimension and turns himself inside out or upside down or hindsight foremost and comes back and exhibits himself in triumph. Then, when he is ready, he effects another disappearance and another change and is back on earth an ordinary human being. The world is full of schools of thought, theologians and metaphysicians and professors of academic philosophy, transcendentalists and theosophists and Christian scientists, who perform such mental monkey shines continuously before our eyes. They prove what they please and the fact that no two of them prove the same thing makes clear to us, in the end, that none of them has proved anything. The Christian scientist asserts that there is no such thing as matter, but that pain is merely a delusion of mortal mind. He continues serene in this faith until he runs into an automobile and sustains a compound fracture of the femur, whereupon he does exactly what any of the rest of us do, goes to a competent surgeon and has the bone set. On the other hand, some devoted young socialists of my acquaintance have read Hegel and Dietzkin and have adopted the dogma that matter is the first cause and that all things have grown out of it and returned to it. They have seen that the brain decays after death. They declare that the soul is a function of the brain and because of such theories, they deliberately reject the most powerful modes of appeal whereby man can be swayed to faith in human solidarity. The best books I know for the sweeping out of metaphysical cobwebs are The Philosophy of Common Sense and The Creed of a Layman by Frederick Harrison, 
leader of the English positivists, a school of thought established by Auguste Comte. But even as I recommend these books, I recall with the dissatisfaction with which I left them, for it appears that the positivists have their dogmas like all the rest. Mr. Harrison is not content to say that mankind has not the mental tools for dealing with ultimate realities. He must needs prove that mankind never will and never can have these tools. I look back upon the long process of evolution and ask myself, what would an oyster think about positivism? What would be the opinion, let us say, of a young turnip on the subject of Mr. Frederick Harrison's thesis? It may well be that the difference between a turnip and Mr. Harrison is not so great as will be the difference between Mr. Harrison and that super race which some day takes possession of the earth and of all the universe. It does not seem to me good science or good sense to dogmatize about what this race will know or what will be its tools of thought. What does seem to me good science and good sense is to take the tools which we now possess and use them to our utmost capacity. What is it that we know about life? We know a seemingly endless stream of sensations which manifest themselves in certain ways and seem to inhere in what we call things and beings. We observe incessant change in all these phenomena and we examine these changes and discover their ways. The ways seem to be invariable, so completely, so that for practical purposes we assume them to be invariable, and base all our calculations and actions upon this assumption. Manifestly, we could not live otherwise, and the spread of scientific knowledge is the further tracing out of such laws, that is to say, the ways of behaving of existence, and the extending of our belief in their invariability to wider and wider fields. Once upon a time we were told that the wind bloweth where it listeth. But now we are quite certain that there are causes for the blowing of the wind, and when our researches have been carried far enough, we shall be able to account for and to predict every smallest breath of air. Once we were told that dreams came from a supernatural world. But now we are beginning to analyze the dreams and to explain what they come from and what they mean. Perhaps we still find human nature a bewildering and unaccountable thing, but some day we shall know enough of man's body and his mind, his past and his present, to be able to explain human nature and to produce it at will precisely as today we produce certain reactions in our test tubes, and do it so invariably that the most cautious financier will invest tens of millions of dollars in a process and never once reflect that he is putting too much trust in the permanence of nature. In many departments of thought, great specialists are now working, experimenting and observing by the methods of science. If in the course of this book we speak of certainty, we mean, of course, not the absolute certainty of any metaphysical dogma, but the practical certainty of everyday common sense. The certainty we feel that eating food will satisfy our hunger, and that tomorrow, as today, two and two will continue to make four. End of chapter one. Chapter two. THE NATURE OF FAITH Attempts to show what we can prove by our reason, and what we know intuitively, what is implied in the process of thinking, and without which no thought could be. The primary fact that we know about life is growth. Herbert Spencer has defined this growth, or evolution, in a string of long words which may be summed up to mean the process whereby a number of things which are simple and like one another become different parts of one thing which is complex. If we observe this process in ourselves and the symptoms of it in others, we discover that when it is proceeding successfully, it is accompanied by a sensation of satisfaction, which we call happiness 
or pleasure. Also, that when it is thwarted or repressed, it is accompanied by a different sensation, which we call pain. Subtle metaphysicians, both inside the churches and out, have set themselves to the task of proving that there must be some other object of life than the continuance of these sensations of pleasure which accompany successful growth. They have proven to their own satisfaction that morality will collapse and human progress come to an end unless we can find some other motive, something more permanent and more stimulating, something higher, as they phrase it. All I can say is that I gave reverent attention to the arguments of these moralists and theologians, and that for many years I believed their doctrines. But I believe them no longer. I interpret the purpose of life to be the continuous unfoldment of its powers, its growth, into higher forms, that is to say, forms more complex and subtly contrived, capable of more intense and enduring kinds of that satisfaction which is nature's warrant of life. If you wish to take up this statement and argue about it, please wait until you have read the chapter, Nature and Man and noted my distinction between instinctive life and rational life. For men, the word growth does not mean any growth, all growth, blind and indiscriminate growth. It does not mean growth for the tubercle bacillus, nor growth for the Anopheles mosquito, nor growth for the housefly, the spider, and the louse. Neither do we mean that the purpose of man's life is in any pleasure, all pleasure, blind and indiscriminate pleasure, the pleasure of alcohol, the pleasure of cannibalism, the pleasure of the modern form of cannibalism, which we call making money. We have survived in the struggle for existence by the cooperative and social use of our powers of judgment, and our judgment is that which selects among forms of growth, which gives preference to wheat and corn over weeds and to self-control and honesty over treachery and greed. So when we say that the purpose of life is happiness, we do not mean to turn mankind loose at a hog trough. We mean that our duty as thinkers is to watch life, to test it, to pick and choose among the many forms it offers, and to say, this kind of growth is more permanent and full of promise it is more fertile, more deeply satisfactory, therefore we choose this and sanction the kind of pleasure which it brings. Other kinds we decide are temporary and elusive, therefore we put in jail anyone who sells alcoholic drink and we refuse to invite to our home people who are lewd, and some day we shall not permit our children to attend moving picture shows in which the modern form of cannibalism is glorified. The reader, no doubt, has been taught a distinction between science and faith. He is saying now, you believe that everything is to be determined by human reason, you reject all faith? I answer, no, I am not rejecting faith. I am merely refusing to apply it to objects with which it has nothing to do. You do not take it as a matter of faith that a package of sugar weighs a pound. You put it on the scales and find out. In other words, you make it a matter of experiment. But all the creeds of all the religious sects are full of pronouncements which are no more matters of faith than the question of the weighing of sugar. Is pork a wholesome article of food, or is it not? All Christians will readily acknowledge that this is a matter to be determined by the microscope and other devices of experimental science. But then, some Jew rises in the meeting and puts the question, is dancing injurious to the character? And immediately all members of the Methodist Episcopal Church vote to close the discussion. What is faith? Faith is the instinct which underlies all being, assuring us that life is worth while and honest, a thing to be trusted, 
in other words it is the certainty that successful growth always is and always will be accompanied by pleasure the most skeptical scientist in the world even my friend the physiologist who proves that life is nothing but a tropism and can be produced by mixing chemicals and test tubes this eager friend is one of the most faithful men i know he is burning up with the faith that knowledge is worth possessing and also that it is possible of attainment with what boundless scorn would he receive any suggestion to the contrary for example the idea that life might be a series of sensations which some sportive demon is producing for the torment of man more than that this friend is burning up with the certainty that knowledge can be spread that his fellow man will receive it and apply it and that it will make them happy when they do why else does he write his learned books in defense of the materialist philosophy and that same faith which animates the great monist animates likewise every child who toddles off to school and every chicken which emerges from an egg and every blade of grass which thrusts its head above the ground not every chicken survives of course and all the blades of grass wither in the fall nevertheless the seeds of grass are spread and the chickens make food for philosophers and the great process of life continues to manifest its faith in the end the life process produces man who as we shall presently see takes it up and judges it and makes it over to suit himself you will know from this that i am what is called an optimist whereas some of the great philosophers of the world have called themselves pessimists but i notice with a smile that these are often the men who work hardest of all to spread their ideas and thus testify to the worthwhileness of truth and the perfectibility of mankind there has come to be a saying among settlement workers and physicians who are familiar with poverty and its effects upon life that there are no bad babies and good babies there are only sick babies and well babies in the same way i would say there are no pessimists and optimists there are only mentally sick people and mentally well people everywhere throughout life both animal and vegetable health means happiness and gives abundant evidence of that fact all healthy life is satisfactory to itself when it develops reason it tries to find out why and this is yet another testimony to the fact that having power and using it is pleasant when i was in college the professor would propound the old question would you rather be a happy pig or an unhappy philosopher my answer always was i would rather be a happy philosopher the professor replied perhaps that is not possible but i said i will prove that it is End of chapter 2